Warhammer 40k does have a reputation for the plastic miniatures perhaps being surprisingly expensive for what they are, so in this video I thought we'd talk through 20 ways in which you might be able to save some money and hopefully hobby on a slightly tighter budget or potentially afford more little plastic or resin men to put on the table. Let's go through a few tips in a slightly random order, mixing in a few obvious or generalised things, two things that are quite niche, and if there's any other money saving things that I've missed, feel free to let me know down in the comments. Jumping straight in, and perhaps the most simple and well known money saving thing in Warhammer 40k, is to make use of discount retailers wherever you might be in the world, something that's second nature to a lot of people out there, but for new people joining the hobby. Games Workshop's discount system maybe isn't the most obvious thing to figure out. Usually you'd expect that buying the models directly from the source will be the cheapest place, so going through Games Workshop, but for some reason Games Workshop have decided to set it up so that other retailers can stock their same models, they get them at trade prices, and they do have some wiggle room to be able to sell them at a significant discount compared with Games Workshop's own web store. Amounts that are discounted do vary a bit, usually somewhere between say 8 and 20 or so percent. It is a bit region specific, but these things are usually easy enough to find if you're in a country where Warhammer is sold in a big way. Usually just googling discount Warhammer in your country will usually give you a few results if there are any, and perhaps a few Reddit threads discussing some of the better ones. This one does feel like a bit of a no-brainer if you are trying to save a bit of money compared with Games Workshop. With the price of Warhammer kits, this will add up to a significant amount of money really quite quickly. And of course it can be a good way to help support your local store as well. If you do have somewhere nearby that sells discounted models and also allows you to game there, there's tons of examples out there. I do have plenty listed down in the video description as channel affiliates. In the UK there's Element Games for usually around 15% off. In the USA there's Noble Knight or Amazon, typically a bit more like 8-10% to off. For Australia and New Zealand there's the excellent Gap Games for 21% off. Not bad considering just how expensive it is for folks who live down under. And in Canada there's Fenris Workshop where they have 10% off plus a fairly generous store credit scheme. There's plenty of others out there, including lots of operators for the EU, literally just give it a search. But if you were looking to save a little bit of money, then these guys generally have the vast majority of the Warhammer 40k range. There's just a few things that are direct only, and the Forge World resin models that won't be represented here. They often tend to be more niche character kits or resin kits, and a few older release plastic ones that don't get given to the discounters. Next up, one recurring theme over the past few editions has been the Warhammer 40k Hachette Parkworks magazines. So far there have been two of these for Warhammer 40k and some for Age of Sigmar as well. Warhammer Conquest pitted Space Marines against Death Guard for the 8th edition of the game and Warhammer Imperium had Space Marines plus some Imperial allies against Necrons. A few places in the world I believe that that was still running or coming to its tail end. Unless Games Workshop decides to shake things up or Hachette feel differently, then it seems very likely that we're going to be getting one for Space Marines vs Tyranids in 10th edition. And in the past, these have been consistently really quite good deals for magazines that often come with Games Workshop miniatures for a significantly discounted price, sometimes some exciting stuff like new unique sculpts as well. For these ones, you can either get the entire thing as a subscription, that means you get the big bundle of everything, for Imperium it's all the stuff that you could see here, Plenty of Necron, Space Marines, other Imperial stuff, and terrain, plus paints and things. It does add up to a significant discount on the things overall, but perhaps to get the absolute cream of the value, you could just try and target some individual issues. Often, they're just literally Games Workshop kits sold at a massively marked down price. They'll tend to sell out fairly quickly on the magazine's own web store, but some places around the world have magazines that you can order in ahead of time. I believe Forbidden Planet have had them before. These things have had different release dates in different parts of the world. They'll likely have staggered releases in the UK, USA, and a fair few EU countries and things. And while they're running, it also means that second-hand prices like eBay can go down quite a lot due to Games Workshop kind of flooding the market with very cheap kits like these. Even if you don't get them at stock value, it means that you might be able to pick up things a little bit cheaper than otherwise while they're running. Next up, talking Warhammer 40k rulebooks. If you're buying these for literally the rules alone, I'd probably be a little bit wary as to literally picking up every one for every one of your factions right when they release, perhaps depending a little bit on which armies you're actually collecting and playing. This will be quite different for players with just one army or maybe two armies that they do regularly play with all the time, compared with people who've been collecting a long time and might have several on the go. People who have only one or two armies that do actively use and play with them really quite a lot are probably going to pick up the codex for the most part, 
though plenty of people choose not to. But if you've got lots of collections on the go and you think that you're going to be sticking with something else as your primary playing army, it might well be worth just not actually picking up the codex until as and when you're actually playing with them in earnest. Currently Games Workshop has free downloads for the vast majority of the armies out there besides the ones that have actually been updated with codexes already. You could just save these as PDFs and then do a bit of editing to edit in the changes when they become known when people review them. That will at least give you a reasonable copy of all the data sheets if you're only going to be using them occasionally. And also bear in mind codex life cycles for when you're thinking about picking up. If you come to a faction and it looks like you're right at the very end of the edition, bear in mind that the life cycle might be kind of limited. And often GW tell us when the codex are coming ahead of time. Say for example, if you're collecting Dark Angels or Chaos Space Marines at the moment, we know that their codexes are coming in spring, so there's probably less point in picking up the data cards for them right now, as they're shortly to be outdated. Supplement books and campaign things when Games Workshop makes them, I would be very wary of as well. Unless you really think that you're going to be playing a Crusade campaign and get a lot of use out of it, they might be worse value than the codexes. I'd say they tend to have a shorter useful shelf life than the big army books for the most part. If you're looking to go super cheap, there are plenty of unofficial rules repositories for 40k rules out there as well. Things like Warhopedia, Battlescribe and New Recruit among plenty of others. There's lots of places out there that basically just repost Games Workshop's rules and have them up on the internet for free. I'm sure much to Games Workshop's displeasure, but I believe that they can't really do much about them. I understand something to do with sharing data for a game not really being something that you can copyright away. Some people do have strong feelings about using them one way or the other, but plenty of people do use them to get their hands on faction rules without picking up codexes if they can't afford them. Otherwise though, one thing that I probably would recommend is considering reselling codexes before they're outdated. Sometimes Games Workshop's fancy rulebooks can get cycled around a bit depressingly fast. Just ask the Imperial Guard and the World Eaters from early 2023. Their codexes weren't active for long before 10th edition came out. If it's clear from rumours or just general Games Workshop release cycles that a book's going to get outdated, it might well be worth it to you to try and sell it a few months ahead of time before they basically become fancy picture books with some outdated rules attached. I'd guess that most editions in 10th edition are still going to be good until the next edition of the game. Games Workshop seems to do their editions in three yearly release cycles these days. But in general it might not be the worst idea to get into the habit of reselling a few of these a little bit early. It can get you back a significant portion of the cost that you invested in the codex to put toward the next one. and makes the overall cost of rules a bit less expensive. Obviously they do have some appeal beyond just the rules themselves. Lots of people like just to have them on their shelves to get them down and read the law and stuff from time to time. There's nothing wrong with that either if you're still getting value out of them. Next up for modelling and painting type things. I feel like this is one area where people can tend to overspend on 40k things. Which while all the accessories and things that Games Workshop tries to upsell you on might be fun and they might be genuinely good products. I have seen it where some people basically bought perhaps too many of these and then didn't really have enough left over in their hobby budget for actual miniatures. When a codex comes out, Games Workshop often bring out other accessory things like faction specific dice, which some people like but are far more expensive than dice that you could just get elsewhere. Things like Space Marines might increase in cost far more if you wanted to get the chapter specific shoulder pads for literally every one rather than using transfers. And Games Workshop's hobby tools tend to be more expensive than things that you could get from other hearts and craft stores, often just for the fancy Citadel branding. For example, the plastic shears here do the job well, but they're £21 or $35. You could get something that does the job for far cheaper than that. And even things like Warhammer branded water pots will set you back far more than a beaker or paint pot that you might already have lying around at home. Particularly for the painting accessory type things, I'd strongly consider non-Games Workshop options, as unlike the miniatures, you don't really get all that much more just by having the warhammer sort of branding on there, and often you might even be able to get superior products at a cheaper price. Basically, if trying to hobby on a budget, I probably wouldn't go down literally every single upsell that Games Workshop offers you, and keep the main focus on the actual miniatures, glue and paint, if you're trying to get together a collection on a budget. Perhaps one other slightly lesser known Warhammer 40k deal is the US Target exclusive Space Marine board game. This one's one that's come out with 10th edition, kind of tied in with the Space Marine 2 game release that should be coming out in the not too distant future hopefully. But in any case it might be something that's a bit less obvious that it's in Games Workshop's product range, 
as it's only sold in Target stores, I believe locked only to the USA. The actual reviews of the game itself aren't anything particularly exciting. I feel like often the focus is on the miniatures and just giving you a mini version of Warhammer 40k that's far removed from the actual main game or people who genuinely make actual board games for a living. But it does seem to be actually a surprisingly good deal for the miniatures themselves. $39 for Lieutenant Titus, 20 Termagants and 2 Ripper Swarms for the Tyranids. And in general, between a unique character and all the Tyranid Termagants, that's perhaps a surprising amount of plastic for the money. I'm guessing that quite a lot of Tyranid players out there probably have more Termagants than they need if they're part of the Leviathan and Starter Set deals. But if you wanted more for surprisingly cheap, you could potentially buy this and then sell Titus on eBay, allowing it to be shipped worldwide. As due to Games Workshop locking the thing to one region, there will be demand in other regions that can only be met by people from the USA selling them elsewhere. I'd argue that's a lot more justifiable than actually scalping something that's in limited resource. It's just Games Workshop have decided to release this in one part of the world, but not give any of the rest of them some. And there will be people who want that model. In any case, I thought it was kind of interesting. Almost feels like the smallest Warhammer 40k starter set compared with the other ones. When collecting and building up 40k armies, I'd be a little bit wary of older sculpts that are going to be at risk of being replaced or renewed. Perhaps particularly the ones that Games Workshop has a risk of sending to Warhammer Legends and not supporting the rules for anymore, but also I guess just ones that they might update new and updated miniatures for. Miniatures that in hindsight you might be tempted enough to actually pick up the new version for, making the old one a kind of poor purchase in hindsight. As they perhaps the single best example of this at the moment are Firstborn Space Marines. Games Workshop hit us with a massive cull of these guys towards the start of 10th edition. It does seem like there's a very reasonable chance that Games Workshop might come for the rest and replace them with Primaris things next time, or at least for the majority of the infantry. In the meantime though, probably some of the things most at risk are the other Divergent Space Marine chapters and their Firstborn miniatures. It does seem pretty much inevitable that we will get some revamped miniatures for Space Wolves and Blood Angels at some point, and as with things like the Assault Squad, the Command Squad, or the Dark Angels Deathwing Knights, we might well see updated and re-sculpted versions of some of their elites and unique miniatures, and maybe say things like Blood Angels Sanguinary Guard, Space Wolves Grey Hunters or Blood Claws, or things like Death Watch Bikers might well be on borrowed time kind of likely for updates when their codex rolls around, and they might or might not have war gear and rules that are particularly cohesive with the thing that came before. The same could be true of really quite a lot of other armies out there, say Aspect Warriors for the Eldar. I'm sure Games Workshop will get around to updating all the resin ones, it's just a matter of time, though it could be waiting for a long time yet. Or basically things like the entire Grey Knights army line, particularly their infantry and Terminator kits. Again, with all Space Marines seeming to be going to primary scale gradually, it seems pretty much inevitable that Games Workshop will update them and give them some shiny new bigger Terminators and bigger Stripe Marines. But at the moment, we really have no idea when they might be shown that love. It could be this edition. It could be a long way in the future. Overall, basically, I'd just be a little bit wary of getting into a faction where there's the potential for the entire miniature line to be slightly invalidated in one way or another particularly things that might just go away and never come back with any replacement, but also to a lesser extent, things that might have you feeling bad. When Games Workshop releases some really quite cool sculpts for, say, some shiny new Primara Scale Sanguinary Guard that look awesome, when you've just put in loads of money, time and effort into painting up these ones, that might be a bit of a frustrating moment for some people. Perhaps one of the other most obvious hot topics at the moment is 3D printing for Warhammer 40k or other miniature war games. It's been a hobby that's slowly growing, particularly over the past few years. I feel like by the time we've got to this point in the video, we've probably already had loads of people comment 3D printer go burr or something similar. If you want to dedicate your hobby time to running your own little 3D miniature printing factory, then it can absolutely be a massive tool in saving money on printing miniatures that could be usable in Warhammer 40k. There's a massive amount of people making sculpts out there that just so happen to be surprisingly good stand-ins for various Warhammer 40k armies. The majority of them know what line they can tread, basically trying to make something that looks legally distinct, but also has the same sort of general feel of certain factions' miniatures. Perhaps the Astra Militarum slash Imperial Guard tend to be particularly good examples of this, as Games Workshop can't really copyright just generic sci-fi soldier with a laser gun, particularly when they tend to be mixed with lots of real-world inspirations from various areas of history. There's absolutely loads out there if you give it a search. Popular spots are things like Colts 3D, My Mini Factory, 
or plenty of individual creator Patreons. There are examples you can find out there for literally every single Warhammer 40k army these days. For getting a 3D printer up and running, the actual machine itself tends to cost somewhere in the region of 200 to 400 pounds or 250 to 500 dollars. And then there might be a few peripheral purchases beyond that, say a wash and cure station, which is often one of the more reliable ways to achieve the actual curing of the resin, though some people like to use just standard UV light and more low-tech solutions. I'll leave a link to Elegoo, which is one of the more popular brands for miniature wargaming. Some of their most popular models for Warhammer type printing are the Mars series or the Saturn series that they have. A Saturn a bit bigger and bulkier, and you can print more things in one go. It does take an initial outlay, but considering the price of big plastic box sets, that could be easily won back if you do use it quite a bit. It is, however, a hobby that's not going to be literally for everyone. I think it's important to recognise that as well. If you were picking up a 3D printer, I'd certainly want a safe, well-ventilated room to avoid suffering any resin fumes. A lot of them come with fancy filters these days, but even with that, I wouldn't want it running alongside me all day. It does take a bit of time and troubleshooting, and when you have printed the miniatures, they do have a bit of a different feel to them, to Games Workshop plastics if that's what you like, and they might not necessarily be welcome in all environments. Certainly Games Workshop stores, certain local hobby stores might be more or less friendly to them as well. It is definitely a really powerful money-saving option for people who are into it though. You can print individual miniatures, entire armies, or aesthetic upgrades like custom heads or shoulder pads and things. And even if you don't want to run the 3D printer yourself, you could potentially make use of other people who print on demand either selling things that they have designed, or will print things that you send them. Back into the world of plastic kits once more though, and whether you're buying things from Games Workshop or local gaming stores, perhaps one of the single most powerful ways to save money in 40k is delaying purchases till a bit later, and basically aiming not to wind up with a massive pile of unbuilt model boxes, tempted in by miniature deals or shiny new releases, and then not actually having enough time to get around to paint and finish them, until the next thing comes out. In general, if you can possibly avoid having a massive pile of shame slash pile of potential, it is generally likely to save you money in the long run. Sure, some deals might be better than usual from Games Workshop, but usually they do have new ones come along every so often, and miniatures aren't going to do you any good if they literally just sit in a big pile of boxes for 10 years, never opened, and then resold, potentially for a similar amount, potentially for a big loss. I feel like there's perhaps some value in having a bit of a stockpile of things for different projects that you could work on, but if it starts to get out of hand, you're definitely getting into negatives beyond that. I'd probably ideally not have any more than a couple of unopened kits or boxes at a time, and just work towards the next thing sustainably. In general, you'll always be able to order something later, and by the time you actually get round to the position where you could paint it, you might have more interest in something else, or GW might have released another shiny new thing which actually tempts you more in hindsight. One other slightly more out of the box way of getting your hands on a few miniatures for cheaper could be entering any free prize draws going out there. Obviously this isn't really something that you'd rely upon, but if you have a little bit of free time or engaging with either Games Workshop or various creators already, there are a fair few people out there who run Warhammer style giveaways. Games Workshop often do ones with their own promos, if you keep an eye on Warhammer community, every so often they'll have one on offer where if, say, you sign up to their newsletter or do some other sort of simple basic task, then you get in with a chance of winning some new miniature goodies of one sort or another. The main trade-off there is that they get to send you more marketing type things and maybe just keep you a bit more engaged with the hobby. Otherwise, there's a fair few content creators out there, myself included, who do semi-regular giveaways here on YouTube or on other platforms. Lots of those have free entry as well. The main advantage for us is that it drums up a bit more interest and goodwill around the channels and perhaps some slightly higher engagement. So it's basically seen as a worthwhile investment to many. For a small slightly shameless self-plug, I do do a monthly giveaway on the channel that can be entered completely for free via Facebook each month. A post appears on the All Specs Tactics Facebook page on the first of each month and is active for around 24 hours. If you reply to that with a picture and your name handwritten within the same photo, then it gets entered into the prize draw alongside all the channel's Patreon backers as well, who support me and allow me to keep on making videos like this. The winners are chosen with a random number generator each month. Obviously, I'm not really bill anything that's got paid entry as a saving it money sort of thing. That's more if you want to support the creators for making videos. 
but for anything with a free entry option as this one does, it could be just one small chance of getting your hands on a fair bit of shiny plastic. The only real cost is the time taken to enter, which is usually quite quick, and for some of the social media engagement type things you might have to endure a little bit of spam, as with Games Workshop's newsletter. For my giveaways at least, the way they work tends to be like this. My January one is for 10 combat patrols, one box each to 10 different winners, and they can be of your choice. Two different ways of entering, as mentioned in the previous slide, either on Patreon or supporting via social media for free. Entering the draw via the Facebook page. I do this each month, so you could check back on the Facebook later on if you'd like to see more. The next one should be for the copies of the new Dark Angels Deathwing Assault box set. That'll be the one for February. Otherwise, for general collecting in Warhammer 40k, I definitely bear in mind that some factions are much, much cheaper to collect than others out there. Certain armies just have a really good reputation for being relatively good deals as Games Workshop goes, and some have the absolute opposite end of the spectrum, famed for being just massively financially costly to put together, at least if you're going down the route of new Games Workshop plastic kits route. In general, I'd have a rough idea of the amount of points that you're getting in each box of model soldiers, the amount of nice plastic, and the kind of weight or mass of the miniatures on the table. And perhaps to a lesser extent, the amount of options in the army is generally going to have a factor in the overall price that you might potentially wind up spending. Armies where you only need a few copies of just maybe a few key units are generally going to be easier to complete, in air quotes. For slightly better value armies, in general things like Imperial Knights of both types are usually not the worst. On the better end of the points per dollar sort of spectrum, but in general they just don't really have that many variations. If you use some magnets then you could have pretty much most of the faction just to flex in or out. Otherwise hyper elite armies tend to do well, things like Adeptus Custodes or Grey Knights, maybe Custodes if you stay away from the Forge World range. And otherwise elite armies like Space Marines tend to have absolutely tons of discount deals on offer, they tend to get things really quite regularly for that. Maybe to a lesser extent Chaos Space Marines as well, but they don't tend to have as good discount offerings. On the other end of the spectrum, things like Adeptus Mechanicus may be some of the most famed armies for being just ridiculously expensive for what they are. Imperial Guard, Gene Stealer Colts, Adeptus Auroritus, Orcs and Tau Empire are really quite expensive for the amount of points you get as well. A few of them are maybe slightly alleviated by good deals. The Gene Stealer Colt Combat Patrol box set is a rather good one. Hopefully they keep that around. I still say that none of these are undoable if you just collect slowly and sustainably, but bear in mind that just with average monthly spending or something, you take a lot longer to arrive at, say, a 1,000-point army or 2,000-point army with one faction compared with some of the rest. Speaking of magnets for Imperial Knights, they can be a part of the hobby that takes a little bit of time to learn and get good with, and has a little bit more initial expense for actually buying the things. But if you're thinking that you're going to be in Warhammer 40k for the long haul, and each miniature that you're fielding will see multiple additions worth of action, then being able to chop and change loadouts can be a massive advantage, and maybe even stop you making purchases further down the line of basically the same miniature with a slightly different loadout. In general, the internet tends to have some pretty good tutorials for magnetising minis. Usually the ones that tend to be best and most valuable are ones with lots of different weapon options, and perhaps some obvious hard points, say this Lehman Ross tank here. Being able to swap out the turret gun and the hull mounted weapon is quite nice, never mind extra things like taking sponsons on and off and swapping other weapons and pins or mounted things around. Maybe other good, particularly good options are things like the Tau battle suits, they've got some nice distinct hard points to mount magnets on. Space Marine dreadnoughts and tanks can be doable enough, and Imperial and Chaos Knights I'd say are perhaps some of the best examples. Just buying a single Questorus Knight could mean that you could field it in basically every single combination if you do magnetise things up and paint stuff up. It can be quite nice to be able to shake up the gameplay experience as well, say if you just want to flex into Lehman Rosses with all Punisher Gatling cannons to go a bit mad with the anti-infantry, or play Chaos Knights with nothing but melee in them for a game, then you can, and that can be really quite rewarding. Getting into a few of Games Workshop's discount deals next, and again one of perhaps the most obvious things for saving money on an army are the Combat Patrol box sets. At the time of recording, these things are priced at £95, €125, Euros, or $160, US dollars, and for the most part tend to be pretty good discounts compared with buying separately. Depending on the exact army and the exact faction, you usually get somewhere between 20 and 50% off the same cost of the miniatures if you bought them individually. 
Noah would bear in mind that the stock discount isn't the be-all and end-all. If you've got miniatures in the box set that you just don't really value as much, then that's going to lessen the appeal. Despite this though, I would rate almost every single Combat Patrol box set as pretty much worth it if you are getting into the faction, even ones that are perhaps less loved like the Death Guard or Thousand Sun ones which are really heavy on their cultist equivalents. I still think that they have value enough to fill out the hoardy part of your army, even if it's perhaps not going to be aimed to be the core of your force. Perhaps for some of their better offerings, I feel like the Drukhari, Gene Stealer Colts, Grey Knight and Custodes ones are nice for their own reasons. Drukhari and Gene Stealer Colts just have a fairly impressive amount of quite nice minis for their faction. Custodes and Grey Knights don't have as big on paper discount, but the Custodes gets you a whole ton of points in the box, and the Grey Knights basically comes with the vast majority of their plastic range all in one kit, so any discount overall on that is pretty handy, and you could buy multiple copies. Besides the unfavoured two of them, the Combat Patrol box sets can generally be picked up at local gaming store discount things, so it is kind of nice to compound a discount on top of a discount, and get quite a lot of miniatures for a lot cheaper than you might expect. Speaking of these two though, I'd argue that currently the Combat Patrol box set for Space Marines and Tyranids are currently kind of small traps that they've brought into their model range. These ones are web store only, so no offering of discounts, and are basically directly inferior to other products in their range. Namely, you'll literally be passing up free miniatures and a discount if you bought these, instead of getting the standard 40k starter set and one additional unit that you could purchase directly. Basically, if you're looking to save money, there is literally no reason to buy these. You can get the exact same miniatures for cheaper, as well as get some free miniatures included from the other faction out of these two. I feel like out of the two of them, the Tyranids one really isn't bad for plastic and kind of fun sculpts within the box, but just get it from the starter set, not from this. Speaking of which, here are the main two Warhammer 40k starter sets that I most consider, the standard starter set and the ultimate starter set, or potentially the Leviathan box if it's available at discount retailers or Warhammer stores near you. I'd argue that the standard 40k starter set is perhaps some of the very best value in terms of models per money out of Games Workshop right now. Pretty much all of the Tyranids and Space Marine Combat Patrol box sets that you could pick up the extra units for if you wanted. Really not too bad for £65 or $110, at least compared with the rest of their kits. Basically, if you were thinking about getting the entirety of the combat patrols, though, for both factions, then you could think about the ultimate starter set. It also comes with the rule book and a bit of terrain as well. I think relative to Games Workshop's other offerings, if you are into either Space Marines or Tyranids, these ones are pretty reasonable pickups. I feel like at this point in time, if you establish collectors for either Space Marines or Tyranids, there's a good chance that you might have the models involved already, either from Leviathan or from these. Moving on, one other thing that can give you a lot of power when collecting Warhammer miniatures is having the power to resell miniatures, something I talked about in its own video in the not too distant past on the channel. But if you wanted to do some dangerous justification for purchases, you could tell yourself that Warhammer miniatures do hold their value really quite well. Usually, if you treat the miniatures nicely, paint them okay, and don't damage or break them or anything, often you could sell them on eBay and get, say, somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of the money that you paid for them from them. And even after eBay fees, that's probably going to be getting around about half the model's price back. eBay is the one that I'm most familiar with, really quite a big marketplace and perhaps a little bit more buyer and seller protection than some places. Of course, they do charge their fees for service. Other people around the world might have better places for that, things like just local groups of friends, Facebook Marketplace, forums, Craigslist, Discord servers, or some local gaming stores have various schemes for trading in miniatures, though in general they might offer you a bit less than you might like for that, as they're taking on the work of selling them, and they have to turn a profit. It really is a useful skill to have in your hobby toolkit though, you can sell entire armies when you're sure you're done with them, maybe sell parts of discount boxes that you don't need, say for example if there's a really good versus box where you're really interested in one half but not the other side, that can make them far more viable if you don't have people to split them with, or maybe sell off an unwanted part of something that you've bought second hand, maybe a friend's army that they no longer wanted that they've sold to you, but you're really not bothered about a few of the units, you could potentially put them back online and have the bits that you do want at a much cheaper deal rather than having the miniatures that you're not bothered about. Just for extreme basics of eBay selling, I'd usually try and sell miniatures as usable units in-game individually, 
Usually that's to get you a little bit more than full armies, though it would take a bit more time and effort with posting and packaging and things. You can search for things via sold items on eBay. You can check the checkbox on the side of the screen to tell what prices they actually sell for. And my usual preferred style of them is to list the item as a buy it now price, and then gradually every week or so ratchet down the amount that you're charging for it by 10% or so, until the point where it actually sells. You could just list things in a big job lot if you don't really have much time for faffing around with that, or go for some auctions which will probably get your sales quicker, but might miss out on a bit of the value. With the option to resell things, I'd certainly not be too keen to sell things too quickly though, just because you can resell things and you're temporarily bored of an army doesn't mean that you always should. I've certainly seen multiple people sell off armies or part of armies and then regret it later, perhaps often for people who are really playing maybe a bit more for the rules and then just get bored of an army that Games Workshop's neglected for a while, and then if you've waited around about six months or so till the next balance pass, all of a sudden a bunch of those units that you've just sold off suddenly get really good. In general I'd say that being mediocre in the rules isn't a very good reason to sell, they do change pretty often. And even if you've fallen out of love with the aesthetic and the feel of your army, that's not to say that you'll definitely feel the same way in a few years' time. It might well be worth sitting on it for a bit. Each time you resell things, unless you're some sort of god-tier painter, you're probably going to be losing some money. And even if you are a great painter, you're probably losing a whole load of time and effort in the miniatures that you've painted up. It's still a pretty good way to dispose of armies and get a load of money back at the end of their useful life though, once you're quite sure that you're no longer doing that faction and you're moving on to other things or getting out of the hobby in general. Moving on outside of things like discount deals and anything else, if your primary aim is to get a functional army of one or another factions on the table, generally you'll need enough miniatures to fulfil a certain points cost for how much you're playing, whether it's a 1000 points games or 2000 points tournament armies. One metric that I've been using for really quite a while on the channel is the amount of points per dollar or points per your equivalent local currency. That's just one metric for how close any one kit will get you to getting a certain amount of points on the table. Basically it's just super nice if you've got a nice cheap kit that takes up loads of points in game. That's going to get a big chunk towards your points target, whereas it's pretty painful if you're paying a lot for a kit and it's only a really flimsy unit that's quite lightweight in game. And while they might be very strong for their cost, they might not cost much in game on an individual level. For my rough rule of thumb, I'd say that between one or two is kind of underwhelming to bad value. If you buy miniatures in that sort of range, then in general you're spending around about a thousand to two thousand dollars on a two thousand point army, and some miniatures certainly break that, such as say this Admech Iron Strider Ballastarius, a kit that's just considered really quite expensive for what it is as one chunky chicken walker. Otherwise, I'd say around about 2 to 3-ish points per dollar is fairly standard for Warhammer 40k. 3 to 4 is really quite good for Games Workshop's purposes, things like Custodian Guard or Space Marine Hellblasters, and many of the Combat Patrol box sets tend to fall into this kind of bracket, generally helpful numbers for getting you towards an army of any given size. Usually anything that's for more points per dollar on the tabletop are usually some of Games Workshop's best deals out there. Things like that 40k starter set or the Custodius Combat Patrol box set are in this kind of region, as are a few of their limited edition discount deals. Sort of hand in hand with that, there are plenty of kits out there that are just seen as some of the worst deals from Games Workshop, and most collectors will tend to buy very few of them as a result. I feel like points per dollar is actually a surprisingly good metric of just how much weight and value any given miniature might have in game. But in reality, people judge the value of things by other things, maybe how much plastic you get per the money invested. If you're spending loads of money and get one tiny character miniature as a result, then that's also something that could feel a bit silly. And maybe also the age and quality of the miniatures. Games Workshop does have some resin relics in their range still, or plastic kits that were just never considered particularly good looking. And there might be a bit of an element of how often you think you're actually going to use each miniature in game might be a little bit better to tailor towards things that you think you're going to play time in time out, as opposed to niche choices that are likely to be decorating the shelf a bit more than others. Perhaps for a few examples of things that are considered pretty overcosted, things like Necron Flayed Ones, Chaos Spawn, the Eldar Warlocks kit with the two of those guys, the Orc Mech Guns, and a fair few of the Ad Mech units like the Dragoons or the Cerberus Raiders. Most of those tend to fit the bill as units that you maybe don't get loads of plastic for the amount of money that you spend, and certainly don't get many points in game. 
perhaps bonus points if they look a bit dated as miniatures such as the Chaos Spawn or are particularly spindly miniatures that are monoposed like the Necron Flayed ones. Perhaps particularly for some of these sorts of miniatures, you might consider the option to kit bash or convert bits of the army, perhaps a little bit of kit bashing or upgrading from things that you had in the bits box, or combining Games Workshop kits that you've bought in, or 3D printed parts of one sort or another. For a fair few units in 40k, it's quite possible just to scratch build some pretty convincing alternatives, Maybe things like orc units are particularly great for this, given their entire thing is welding bits of scrap together. Could be nice to make use of some secondhand models or some plastic card and go to town with a few orky spares. Otherwise, things that are a bit more freeform within the 40k lore might be quite nice. Necron Catan shards are maybe a topical example. Transcendent Catan could take all sorts of different forms, just make something roughly the same size and something cool and stargod like, and you're good. You could maybe make some flayed ones out of warriors with some blade conversions, and I feel like individual special characters could be a particularly good choice for this, often paying absolutely loads for the amount of plastic that you get. Plenty of them can be pretty credibly kit-bashed from the things from spares, maybe in particular Space Marine road parts of one sort or another, combine them with some fancy power weapons and a snazzy paint job, and you could make yourself some convincing captains or characters. These can all be very cool just in their own right of course, everyone loves to see nicely converted miniatures, but a lot of the time they could genuinely save you some money along the way. Perhaps some armies are a bit more amenable to it than others though. As well as the permanent additions to Games Workshop's range, GW of course do have plenty of temporary deals out there as well. Games Workshop does like to keep their versus box sets, launch boxes and Christmas battle forces coming as the years go on, in addition to things like their combat patrols. These most commonly tend to crop up when factions have new ranges released for them, or occasionally for a faction versus faction box headed up by some new characters, and of course the Christmas box sets where usually around 6 40k factions get new sets each year, though you don't know which ones are going to receive them. In general these aren't really ones that are there to be relied on. They might just helpfully turn up every so often, and certainly could be one way to jump into a new faction if you've been strongly considering them before. Often they're particularly nice if they pair well with the Combat Patrol box set, say you could get one of these and the Combat Patrol and basically have a pretty much fully functioning army right from the word go. Though again, I'd probably bear this in mind with whether or not you actually want the mix of miniatures in the box set, or whether or not this is just going to tempt you into buying another big box that sits unopened and unpainted for far too long and just adds to the pile of shame. Certainly can be a solid option though, and there might be another interesting discount option available for certain factions that you find out there in the wild, maybe some old copies of things long out of production lurking in a local gaming store. If they're being sold for some semblance of their previous price, they might well have just looked in. For getting a 40k fix on maybe a smaller spend, you could consider smaller alternative games. Games Workshop do have some of their own skirmish offerings, such as Kill Team or Necromunda, set in the grim darkness of the far future. And given that you can just jump into these with just a single squad box set, basically this could be one way that you could scratch the 40k itch without having to drop loads of money on a massive army. They've generally got good reputations, Kill Team in particular is pretty well supported, with really quite a lot of releases coming for them quarterly from Games Workshop usually and could be a potentially good jumpy in place if you wanted to build up to a 40k army, maybe one of the earlier purchases could be the kill team that's appropriate for that faction, as you can typically use them pretty credibly in regular 40k as well. Otherwise you could think about just playing the combat patrol version of Warhammer 40k, again that's its own game mode with the set box sets with their fixed rules, and again that could be something that could get you plenty of games in before you move on to collect a bigger army as and when you have budget for it, Quite outside of Games Workshop's sphere of influence as well, there's all sorts of other hobby companies making their own game systems, plenty of which might be much cheaper to play than 40k. Perhaps one of the most touched examples of an option that you could play instead of Warhammer is One Page Rules Grim Dark Future. They have some of their own miniature ranges, or just kind of miniature agnostic, so you could play with the minis that you want to, and maybe get a similar sort of feel of game. There's loads of other miniature companies out there making their own stuff besides that though, lots of which are cheaper than Games Workshop, just because they're perhaps one of the most widely played games out there doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be the one that you most enjoy, and it might be worth just asking around what other people play locally for other things that you might be interested in, you might just not have heard of them yet. Back to 40k itself though, 
And again, other fairly basic and well touched advice is that avoiding chasing the meta might be a good idea, unless you are getting into the hobby with very specific aims and trying to build up the absolute top meta hotness to go stompy events far and wide. I think most people out there will generally agree that rules can be kind of temporary from Games Workshop, points change, strong stuff changes, and the entire way that factions play can be altered, but if you're getting at least fairly recent plastic miniatures, then the miniatures are going to be usable and good for a long time to come, so you may as well get things that you actually like, and not just literally go for the thing that's best in game at the moment, and just get three copies of all things that are considered a bit too strong. On the flip side of that though, I think it's unrealistic to say that people don't collect at least somewhat for what's usable in game right now. If you are engaging with the game in a big way and you want to theory craft some lists and things, in general you might want to do a bit of tailoring things to stuff that's effective on the table right now. It's not guaranteed to always be that way, but at least being able to put it on the table in the here and now and feel good about it isn't the worst in the world. I feel like the vast majority of hobbyists tend to tread a bit of a middle line, usually choosing armies and paint schemes and things as to the lore, fluff, feel and look of the faction, but then maybe have a bit of a skew towards things that tend to be good in game as they build up armies, even if they do get plenty of things just because they like them. In general though, I just probably wouldn't go too hard towards what's absolutely 100% optimal and just completely eschew things that aren't great right now. As then when Games Workshop inevitably cycles on the rules and rebalances the game, the stuff that was too strong will likely be pushed back into the midfield, other things might come to the fore that you might not own, and in general I'd probably go with having a bit of a broad collection of an army, as opposed to literally just spamming a few very key units that could be enormously brittle if those key units don't get good next time round. As he collecting and building up armies, I certainly wouldn't go throwing away too much of the stuff that's sort of wasted on sprues when you build up miniatures. It will maybe be a bit of an advantage that more veteran hobbyists have over people who are just starting out, but you might well have a very big collection of various different exciting guns and weapon armaments in your collection. Certainly as I've been playing for quite a few years now, it's quite often that if I need to rearm a unit or convert something slightly new, I might well already have the basic bits in a collection to do so, depending on exactly what it is. In particular, I'd try and keep a hold of things that are, say, cool weapon options, or maybe fun alternative heads, or fancy bits to adorn miniatures. If you keep tabs on things, then it could pay some dividends later. Maybe, say, if you managed to pick up some miniatures secondhand, you could have the option to rearm them, or say if the addition's rules change around, and you decide that it's going to be a great idea to have loads of orcs with combi weapons or something like that, then you could do a judicious bit of model surgery if you wanted to, to dig some weapons out of the armory and give the boys some new toys. This one's probably old news to most people around the globe, but for newer hobbyists it might not be too obvious, but I'd certainly be aware of Games Workshop's really quite big variations in regional pricing. Unfortunately, places like Australia and New Zealand get the prices massively marked up compared with the UK, and other places vary around the world a bit. Euros tend to be a little bit more expensive than the UK, the USA is somewhere between Euros and Australia or New Zealand. A few other specific European countries that have a currency other than the Euro might actually be a little bit cheaper than the UK for some things. The reason for this isn't always entirely clear, it seems that Games Workshop maybe set prices in the distant past for their various places around the globe, and then exchange rates have varied a bit since. There's probably some elements of Games Workshop trying to see other areas outside of the UK as a bit more of a profit-making venture, even more so than at home. I'm sure there's some element of import taxes or shipping costs that do contribute. To my understanding though, in general it does seem to add up to a bit more than what you'd expect for import duties and shipping, particularly in the case of Australia and New Zealand, where there's often somewhere around a 50% markup compared with UK prices, which can be a bit dispiriting for collectors down under. Often there might not be the most huge amount of things that you can do about this, I have at least heard tell of some places being able to order in from the UK. Most individual gaming stores won't be able to do this as Games Workshop limits where they can sell, but you might be able to get people, say, selling on other sites. Again, eBay could be one example. Or if you're lucky enough to have friends or family around the world, that could be one way of getting some miniatures at a cheaper cost. It is a bit rubbish for people who live in the places where Warhammer is the most expensive, though. It does feel like a bit of a weird decision on Games Workshop's part, as I'm sure they're turning a profit basically whatever they sell the models for. I feel like they're probably at the point where they'd probably increase sales more if they drop prices a little. 
Not really too sure why they don't make the move to standardise things a little bit more. Seems like it would make sense. I've alluded to it a couple of times already, but as well as being able to sell things online, I'd also be on the lookout for things that you might be able to buy secondhand. Again, maybe varying where you are located in the world as to where's best. In the UK, I'd certainly recommend a quick look on eBay if you're picking up a miniature squad or vehicle. Occasionally, things might have been discounted on the past, or people might be breaking things down from bigger discount kits. Or you might just find someone who's selling a pre-owned and pre-painted version of those miniatures, maybe for a bit less than Games Workshop's cost. As mentioned earlier, depending on the quality and the exact way that they're selling it, it might be somewhere between 50% and full price. Sometimes people are happy to pay just as much as from Games Workshop for very nicely painted and assembled miniatures. Usually the bigger weird mix of things tend to go for a bit cheaper comparatively, as often people won't really want a whole load of random collection of miniatures, some of which might be partially assembled or painted. It can be really quite a good source of individual units from big boxes though, say for example if you look for any individual squad from the Leviathan box set, you can often find it going a bit cheaper than otherwise. Say for example things like Neurotyrants, Psychophages, Termagants and Infernus Marines can be found pretty abnormally cheaply on the internet at the moment. Otherwise, as per the selling things, things like stores selling secondhand miniatures, people reselling things locally, and various social media forums or other online selling platforms are also fair game. Perhaps some of the absolute best deals that I've heard about just from anecdotes tend to be people selling to each other with kind of mates rates, but I would balance that with giving the person selling to you a fair price. If you don't know the seller, then I'd bear in mind that quality could be very variable on eBay. If the miniatures are painted thinly without loss of detail, I've often found in the past that you really don't lose much by repainting over. I feel like the vast majority of painters aren't there aren't really quite at the level where that's going to make actually that much of a difference. It's particularly true for hoardy type miniatures or things that you just want to have tabletop ready and aren't really going for sort of display level quality. Otherwise, there's plenty of ways to paint strip miniatures. Lots of tutorials online for that can take a bit more time, effort and work, but the value saving might well be worth it to you. Otherwise, beyond combat patrols or really big box sets that are kind of obvious as discount options, I would bear in mind that Games Workshop do have a few maybe slightly more subtle discounts out there, some of which are direct only from their web store but still could compete against local gaming store discounts. For the Chaos Space Marines, you get really quite a lot of points on the table and cool plastic for your money with the Warp Forge set. That's got the Obliterators and the Venom Crawler in, and I feel like that's one of the better deals out of the Chaos range. The Space Marine Vanguard Task Force has the Monopose, Infiltrators, Eliminators and Suppressors and Phobos Lieutenant in it. Pretty much a combat patrol's worth of miniatures, but at a cost very slightly less than that, though people tend to be a bit down on this one as they did previously sell it as a much cheaper start collecting type box. Overall though, it's really not too bad in terms of Games Workshop money for the amount of space range that you get in the box set though, though it maybe depends a bit on how much you care about having monopose versus multi-part plastic kits. Otherwise, for the Necrons, they've got an interesting Kill Team box set, where you get a box of Immortal slash Death Marks plus a Technomancer, basically as a flat discount compared with buying the two separately. The Kill Team Hyrotech Circle also comes with a fun extra sprue in it as well, that you could potentially even resell if you wanted maximal savings, but could just get you some fun plasma site type critters to have wandering around as terrain or base interest if you're not actually playing with the Kill Team itself. Otherwise, with all the excitement of 3D printing these days, I would bear in mind there's plenty of other miniature sellers out there that just sell you entire miniatures, not STLs or anything like that. Those of course cool sci-fi things that are pretty awesome creations in their own right, though plenty of them pretty good for stand-in proxies for Warhammer 40k of one sort or another, maybe various flavours of generic power-armoured space knights or human soldiers with laser rifles. Perhaps for one example, this Cromlech walking transport tank looks like it could work quite well for an Astro Militarum Chimera. These sorts of things wouldn't be welcome in official Games Workshop stores or official Games Workshop run tournaments, but beyond that, most places are pretty accepting of them. Pricing on these can vary a bit though, they're often cast in resin and some of them can be the same or more expensive than Games Workshop miniatures, some of them can be a lot less though. Finally, and just one potential value saver for getting an alternative style of Space Marine or Chaos Space Marine army off the ground, you could think about making use of the sheer massive miniatures that are available in the Horus Heresy Age of Darkness box set. 
and getting a cheap Space Marine army that's all clad in the Mark VI armour, plus Cataractar Terminators and the Spartan tank, and use these as proxy forces for Warhammer 40k, with the additional advantage that you've already got something that's ready-made for playing in Heresy. The Age of Darkness box set for the Horus Heresy is £185, $310, or €240, Euros, so it's certainly really quite a big commitment, around about the cost of two Combat Patrol box sets, I feel like the amount and weight of plastic that you get in the box is fairly impressive though. 10 Terminators, 40 Tactical Armoured Space Marines, a Dreadnought, some characters and a Spartan tank. I feel like both of the sets of these could work really quite well either for a standard Space Marine army or a Chaos Marine one. The characters work well for various lords and options, maybe some weapon swaps if you want to. The Cataphractide Terminators work well just for standard Loyalist ones or Heresy Era ones. The Spartan tank is near enough for me to proxy as a land raider. You could maybe mess around with the amount of last cannons it has if you really want to. And the size is a bit different, but nothing that I think is too far wrong in my opinion. The tactical marines could be legionaries, or maybe go for either standard tactical marines or perhaps intercessors for the space marines to run them in the rules. And the dreadnought probably a standard space marine dreadnought or a chaos hellbrute. Overall, between all that, you could get a very cheap force of Space Marines on the board, more so than most. With a bit of work, you could make some Heresy-era versions of other Chaos or Space Marine units if you'd like. Perhaps use some with the special weapon options to make yourself some Hellblasters or something. And overall, it comes in at really quite a cheap Space Marine army, around about 1,600 points of Chaos Marines, for example, around about 5 points per dollar. And you could make that better by reselling the Heresy rulebook if you didn't want to play that game system. Certainly going to be an aesthetic that appeals to some people, but not for others, but that could be one quirky way to make yourself a Space Marine army, with pretty cool and different theming and flavour, and also far less cost than you might be able to get otherwise. In any case, I think we'll leave that there for now. Hope you've enjoyed a bit of discussion around a few different ways that you could save money in the 40k hobby. Look forward to hearing any other feedback on this, or any other thoughts or ideas down in the comments below. I feel like I could certainly talk about a fair few of the topics in this video at much greater length if I wanted to. Check out the links down in the video description for my affiliate links for the discount retailers or Elegoo 3D printers if you are looking to pick them up. Both could be potentially really good ways to save money on getting a 40k collection together. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. I make some model tactics and games workshop releases and collecting. Finally, if you have been enjoying the video or you've found good value out of any of the tips here, I would just like to mention that Allspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.